Recently, China's official media has been promoting selling via online live streaming. Why? Selling via live streaming refers to a new sales model that involves showing products close up. Live streaming generates a daily revenue of thirty thousand RMB or over four thousand US dollars for me. Each time I do live streaming, I got at least fifty thousand to sixty thousand views, and up to more than two hundred thousand views. Basically, demand outstrips supply. I sell all I have in stock, and that's sold out in one second. Providing consultation and answering questions, and guiding purchases via online platforms and live streaming. Similar to Amazon Live, it has become a trend in China in the past five years. The Chinese government is trying to use success stories to get more people involved. However, it fails to tell the Chinese people that the government hopes to turn the unemployed into live salespeople, who can provide a form of flexible employment, hence being a viable way of solving China's serious unemployment problem. Flexible employment is a new term that Beijing has coined so that it can avoid using terms like unemployment or semi-unemployment. China's leading university, Renmin University of China, released a blue paper entitled "China Flexible Employment Development Report" in 2021, which states that tapping into the potential of flexible employment has become one of the important and key driving forces for stabilizing and promoting employment. Flexible employment includes driving for ride-hailing companies, courier drivers, takeout delivery workers, domestic helpers, operating online stores, selling via live streaming, and so on. For many people who are unemployed, there aren't many options available. On the evening of December 28, 2021, a man named Yu Minhong officially launched his first live stream selling on TikTok. He sells mainly agricultural products. Who is Yu Minhong? He is the founder and president of New Oriental Group, based in Beijing, the largest education and training organization in China. In July 2021, the government issued a policy to reduce the burden of homework and off-campus training on students. It devastated off-campus training institutions, including New Oriental. Now Yu has chosen to be a live salesperson. During three-hour live streaming, he sold about 790,000 U.S. dollars in agricultural products. Yu has been one of the few lucky ones who have lost their jobs. He has done well because he has a substantial fortune and significant name recognition. He has managed to turn himself into a live stream celebrity. For countless ordinary Chinese struggling with unemployment, what they are facing is a long dark night. China's economy is struggling, but small businesses, which employ a massive population, have been hit the hardest. The year 2021 is the worst in recent years for entrepreneurs in China. The South China Morning Post reported at the end of 2021 that some 4.37 million small and medium-sized businesses, or SMEs, closed permanently in China in the first 11 months of 2021, while 1.32 million new SMEs opened in the same period. That is more than three times the number of closures than new business startups. It's expected that the number of SMEs written off in 2021 is likely to exceed the number in 2020, which was 4.45 million. The number in 2021 is expected to be a record high, a figure almost twice as high as in 2019 and about 10 times as high as in 2018. In 2018, the ratio of new registrations to deregistrations was 25, meaning that one closure was accompanied by 25 new registrations. Data from China's public registration tracking company Tianyan Cha shows that the rate of deregistration of Chinese SMEs exceeds the number of newly registered enterprises for the first time in 20 years. Even this data is likely to be somewhat smaller than the reality. At the 2021-2022 China Economic Conference organized by a Chinese think tank in mid-December. 
A former Chinese finance minister publicly criticized the government's statistics for failing to reflect the economic downturn, reporting only good news but not bad. Lo, 71, is widely regarded as an outspoken reformist in the Chinese government. He said the government has failed to publish the facts on the other side of the coin, such as the fact that businesses are struggling to operate, that it's difficult to cancel official registrations, and that most businesses aren't actually active. Government statistics only count the number of new jobs, but don't follow up on whether new workers have been laid off in six months or later. In the last two years, private companies in mainland China have been subjected to a series of crackdowns from the government, including large companies such as Alibaba, Tencent, Meituan, New Oriental, etc. Compared to large companies, SMEs have a much harder time surviving the economic downturn. Small companies lack bargaining power with suppliers, and their access to financial support is often less stable. Publicly available data from the Chinese government shows that SMEs are the backbone of China's economy, accounting for half of China's tax revenue, 60% of GDP, and 80% of urban employment. Therefore, if this trend continues for China's SMEs, it will mean slower growth and lower economic vitality in the future. At this point, we see no clear signs that the CCP is trying to improve the situation. According to a December 31 report in China's Securities Daily, the latest news is that 14,000 gaming-related companies have been written off so far since July 2021. In 2020, 18,000 game companies were written off. Game approval by the government has been suspended since July 22, 2021. It's been five months now. Without approval of game license numbers, the games developed by private companies can't be released which means no revenue. The initial investment, including the staff overhead, is down the drain. Currently, there are more than 300,000 game-related enterprises with registered capital below 10 million renminbi in China. In other words, a large number of unemployed people are flocking to the market. Let's go back to the live sales we talked about at the beginning of the show. Will it help solve part of China's employment problem? Chinese people are heavily dependent on the internet and cell phones due to vigorous promotion from the government. A bulletin released by China's National Bureau of Statistics shows that there were close to 1 billion people with internet access at the end of 2020, and most of them access the internet by cell phones. China's media has widely reported the amazing results and wealth of China's live-streaming celebrities. For example, 29-year-old Li Jiaqi is known as Lipstick Number One Guy for his lipstick sales. During Taobao's biggest sales event of the year, he set a sales record of about 1.8 billion US dollars in a single live session of 12.5 hours. At the same event, another live streamer, Vaya, generated sales of about 1.34 billion US dollars in a live session of 14.5 hours. In reality, data from Chinese media shows that leading streamers can earn more than 150,000 US dollars per month. The less known ones may earn only a few hundred US dollars per month, while 99% of live streamers operate at a loss. According to media data on the average income of Chinese live streamers in 2020, only 0.6% earn more than about 8,000 US dollars, and 84.1% earn less than 1,500 US dollars. We have analyzed in the previous episode that the booming industry of selling via live streaming in China is actually hurting many of China's grassroots retailers and creating more unemployed people on the other side. Here we briefly summarize this distorted economic model. According to the Ministry of Commerce of China, the size of China's live e-commerce population stands at 388 million users, accounting for nearly 40% of all internet users. This market is expected to exceed 300 billion US dollars by 2021. There is only one secret to the popular sales model of live streaming, low prices. The internet giants charge high platform fees and use smart algorithms to package and enable celebrity streamers, helping them gain huge traffic. The celebrity presenters enjoy a monopoly of resources, attracting thousands of suppliers. They then use low prices to keep the traffic flowing. 
Whoever has more followers gets a lower price from the suppliers. Live streamers also join hands to form a price alliance and demand lower prices from suppliers. The product that wins in the live stream sales is the one with the best price, not the best quality. That is, the Chinese e-commerce giants have created a business model that draws on the profits from other sectors such as distribution, department stores, warehousing, advertising, mini marts, and the purchasing power of people in third and fourth tier cities in China. The business cycle at the grassroots level in China keeps being disrupted and the cost of the whole society is being pushed up de facto. Chinese internet giants, through leading live streamers, are shaping the production chain of daily necessities in China. The low price approach is giving rise to even lower quality goods. Where does that leave society? In late 2019, Chinese educational institutions surveyed Beijing elementary schools on what elementary students would like to be when they grow up. Nearly 80% of the students wanted to become online celebrities. If young people in China were to flock to a career as online presenters and then fail after a few years to seek a career that would suit them, the country's already fragile economy wouldn't be able to bear it. Now even the top performers are living in a state of deep fear. On December 20th, 2021, VIA was fined 210 million US dollars by the government for tax evasion. Afterwards, thousands of live streamers rushed to pay back taxes. The Chinese public wonders if VIA falls, will it benefit her only competitor, lipstick number one guy, Li Jiaqi? According to the Chinese media, the answer is not likely because the CCP doesn't want a monopoly. In fact, the Consumer Rights Protection Commission of Zhejiang Province has already interviewed 17 online live streamers, including Li Jiaqi. The commission specifically singled out his live streaming studio for irregularities in product labeling. It seems that the CCP is trying to rectify the problem of monopoly in the market economy. Previously, Chinese regulators investigated private internet companies such as Alibaba and Meituan on the grounds of anti-monopoly. Alibaba and Meituan alone were fined about 3.4 billion US dollars for antitrust. According to data compiled by Haitong Securities, this far exceeds the average fine level of about 62 million US dollars over the past five years. Such antitrust is only limited to private companies as it seems as the Communist Party is constructing mega state-owned enterprises at the same time, creating monopolies. As early as October 2020, the Chinese government deployed the three-year action plan for reforming state-owned enterprises 2020 to 2022. It stated that state-owned enterprises should become market players with core competitiveness. In 2021, a number of mega state-owned enterprises have been formed and two alone in the month of December. They are China Rare Earth Group Limited and China Logistics Group Limited. The newly established China Logistics Group Limited has more than 600 branches, 120 dedicated railroad lines, 42 delivery houses, and nearly 3 million professional road freight vehicles. Its network of operations is spread across 30 provinces in China and five continents overseas. This scale is designed to give the company a significant competitive advantage in the international logistics market. On May 8, 2021, Sinochem Group Limited and China National Chemical Corporation Limited were jointly reorganized to form Sinochem Holdings with total assets and revenues of more than 157 billion US dollars. It's described by the CCP's media, People.cn, as the largest chemical company in the world. According to the Chinese media, nearly 40 state-owned enterprises have been restructured since 2012. An official from the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission of China said that the government agency will push for the optimization of the state-owned capital and create a number of leading enterprises in various industries. On December 31st, the Chinese government released its last Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, for 2021, saying the manufacturing PMI rose slightly to 50.3 from 50.1 in December, but the improvement was almost entirely concentrated in large enterprises. It's not yet known to what extent these large state-owned enterprises account in the index. It's the further reflection of effect of the country's policies to guarantee supply, stabilize market prices and ease the pressure of companies, and our means of coping with epidemic and measures of prevention and control have improved, 
plus the fall of raw material cost to a certain extent. All this has contributed to the overall economic recovery and eased cost pressure. The CCP claims in its antitrust campaign that monopoly is inefficient and less innovative, and antitrust is good for the market economy. In practice, however, they are creating more mega-state-owned enterprises and turning a blind eye to their inherent monopolist nature. It appears that the CCP believes in the superiority of socialism or the superiority of centralized power to solve the problems in the face of the dramatic changes in the international environment and the overall decline of the Chinese economy. This red system, as the Chinese people have been repeatedly told, can pool resources together very quickly to solve big problems and achieve big results. But of course, resources are most secure when they are concentrated in the hands of the CCP. The new year is here. Beneath the still glamorous exterior, will the 70-year-old regime's accelerated return to socialism and communism help it improve its economy, or will their policies simply speed up the CCP's collapse?